The video you are about to watch is from an old woodworking magazine that I published during the years of 2003 to approximately 2006. This was a very unique magazine. It was purely video content and it was distributed on DVDs. The magazine ran for approximately three and a half years and then uh, due to financial concerns we simply had to terminate the magazine. We moved on to other things over the last roughly 15 years. However, there has been a request to resurrect this content, so I've gone through the trouble to get the equipment, the products, everything I needed in order to bring this content back to life to share with everyone. Here on this YouTube channel, we'll be putting up approximately 100 to 120 of the original stories that appeared in that magazine. The magazine was called Woodworking at Home Magazine, and it was truly one of a kind in the world. I really hope you enjoy these videos, and please tell your friends about them. The inspiration for this project came from a television commercial. It was for a clothing line for young teenage girls. Now one of the girls happened to be wearing a beret and bell-bottom pants and I just thought that was a very interesting form. So I've taken that form and tried to apply it to a function. In this case, a simple little chest of drawers. It's got the tapered legs which give us our bell-bottoms and then the beret near the top. And that gives us three little pockets that are hidden underneath it. We've incorporated three drawers on bearing slides so that you can store some other items in it as well. Now the construction of this is somewhat complex. There's a lot of machining that goes on here and it requires the making of some templates and so forth. So it's truly a project that is not without challenges. So let's dig right in and start constructing it. The legs and top start out with six quarter stock. Six quarter means that it's six quarters of an inch thick at rough. So it'll start out as an inch and a half rough. Now generally the sawmill will rough plane it on both faces, cleaning it up. And that'll leave you with about an inch and five sixteenths. Now even though this little chest of drawers is somewhat sculptural in nature, we should still start out with good flat, straight, square stock. So I'll start out by planing all my material to the appropriate thickness. And then we'll go over to the jointer and put a nice square and straight edge on one edge of the board. I can now go ahead and cut away the top and the two legs. Now the top I'm going to cut oversized, but the two legs I'll cut exactly to their proper length. What I'm doing now is getting set up to machine that rabbit that goes along the back edge, inside edge, of the legs. Now it's a quarter inch wide by a quarter inch deep rabbit. So I've installed a three quarter inch router bit in my router table raised it up a quarter of an inch and set my fence back so that I'm exposing a quarter inch of it. Now it's just a matter of taking those cuts. To machine that dado I'm using a quarter inch straight router bit in my handheld router and I've affixed a straight edge clamp. On the right side, you can start off the piece and feed up to a mark, and that'll be your ending point. Now on the right hand piece, we'll actually be starting in at that point and feeding in the opposite direction. Here's the right side with the dado machined in it. This will be the left side. We need to machine that dado along here. This is my, in this case, starting point. So what it'll do is bring the router in over this point, drop it down in, and then feed across in that direction. If I were to try and feed from this direction towards me, like so, the router is going to have a tendency to walk away. And that's due to the rotational forces that are exerted while cutting. It's going to pull itself away from the fence. So by starting it at this end, feeding away from me, the cutting forces always drive the router up against the fence so you end up with a nice straight cut. Now that we've got all of our precision machining done on our legs, we can go ahead and start creating the freeform shape of it. And we'll start out by cutting the taper along the front edge of the legs. Now you could do that at the table saw, with a jigsaw, bandsaw, or even a scroll saw. It doesn't have to be perfect because we're going to be blending that in 
with the belt sander in the next step. Now that our leg has the bell bottom shape at the front, we need to also cut away on the side area here. The bandsaw is probably about the only tool you can use to cut this with, but if you don't have a bandsaw, you could spend some time with the belt sander and get it shaved down just as well. After doing the layout on the workpiece, tilt your table on the bandsaw over at about two and a half degrees and line it up with your layout marks. And now we have the bell bottom shape along the outside edge. Next up, let's get this smoothed out on the belt sander. Now if you don't have a bandsaw, you're probably going to spend quite a bit of time here at the belt sander. But nonetheless, it sure gives the piece a nice look. The next step for the legs is to round over the front edge. To do that, we're going to be using the router table, and I've installed a half-inch radius roundover bit in the router table. I've got it set up so that the, the radius edge is flush with the table surface, and the bearing is flush with the front of my fence. Now it's just a matter of taking that cut. Moving on to the lid now, what we need to do is make a template the same size as we want our lid. And that template will be made out of half inch MDF. Now laying it out is a very easy process. Start out by ripping your MDF to the appropriate width. Then make a mark setting your overall width at the wide end. Come in 5 16 of an inch near the narrow end from each end and then draw your lines connecting the dots. And it works out to about two and a half degrees. Now we can go over to the compound miter saw and make that cut. This is where that laser on your miter saw really comes in handy. Now using a drafting template, I can easily pencil in the layout lines for the radius at the front corners. And a few seconds on the belt sander and we got our radius. I've gone through and rough cut my lid material to its approximate size. It's a little bit oversized. Now what I want to do is take our template and attach that to our lid material. Now we want the bottom surface of the lid attached to our template. Now I'm using double face tape and it's not the kind you buy at your department store. It's heavy duty stuff that you can get at most woodworking stores. And I'll just very carefully bring the two pieces together and I'll apply some good pressure for a few moments so that those two pieces get stuck together nicely. To do the cutting, I've got a half inch template bit in my router table. Now what I can do is very carefully guide the workpiece along, taking the cuts. And now we can go ahead and round over the top face of our lid. Now we're going to be using a three quarter inch radius and our lid's only five eighths thick. So if we did this without our template, our workpiece would slide underneath our guide bearing and that wouldn't work out. That's why the template is so important. As we bring our workpiece in and start cutting away the material, eventually the guide bearing will be following along on our template. Rather than just having a small round over here, using that three quarter inch bit really gives the profile a nice look and feel. The templates for making the top pieces to mill out the pockets as well as the outside profile are actually probably easier to make out of several small pieces glued together. Because we have to do routing on these inside areas, it's very difficult to take a jigsaw or even a scroll saw and cut out a nice square opening. But it's very easy to cut the individual pieces and glue them all back together again. So that's what I'm doing here. This template, as you can see, will be used to machine the two outside pockets. Now we'll need another template to machine the inside pocket and the outside profile. Both of them are constructed the same way. So I've already cut the pieces. Now I'll just glue everything together and wait for that glue to set up. Just as we did with the lid, I've attached my template onto my top piece. 
with double face tape, ran around it with a flush trim bit. Now we're ready to start making the pockets in the top surface of the top. To do that, we're going to be using a bowl bit. It happens to be a white side part number 1374. Now I'll be installing this in my plunge router and I'm going to set my depth of cut so that I can go about three quarters of an inch deep into that top surface. Now because of the size of this bit, you're going to need a one inch diameter collar to follow along on your template. Well, it may be a messy operation, but it sure does a great job of putting in a nice little pocket. Now I've removed the first template, and now we can put on the second template and get the other two pockets put in. With the pockets now machined, we're going to be rounding over the bottom edge of our top panel. Now we're going to start out with a quarter inch radius round over bit. Now we're going to switch over to a much larger inch and a quarter radius round over bit and we'll be rounding over the top surface where the pockets are of our top panel. And again because the bearing would be above our workpiece we need to reattach our template. Because this is such a large radius round over bit I'm going to take it in several light panels. it'll probably take a little bit of hand sanding to blend everything together. What, you think David should be the only one to have fun with the carving tools? Actually, all I'm doing is going through and carving out a little relief area so that your finger can get underneath the lid to lift it up. Now, once I get it shaped up the way I want it, I'll hit it with some fine sandpaper to clean it up a little bit. My technique isn't quite up to David's standards yet. And that should about do the trick. To hinge the lid, I'm going to be using these 10 millimeter diameter barrel hinges. Now we're going to need to drill two holes in the lid and two holes in the top. Now we want those to be 3 and 5 eighths either side of center and 5 sixteenths of an inch in from the back edge. Now because we have to have all four of these holes to line up properly, a jig is really the best way to do it. So I started out to make this jig, I drew a mark representing the center line, measured over my 3 and 5 eighths and then came in. 5 sixteenths of an inch, carefully drill the two holes. Then I check them before going on to the next step. I want to make sure that those are exactly where I want them. Now, to transfer those hole locations into both our lid and our top, I'll just use double face tape and then I'll line up the center line mark on the jig with the center line mark on the lid as well as the top and then we can drill those holes. After carefully setting my depth stop so that I drill 7 sixteenths of an inch into my lid, I'll go ahead and drill those holes. Be careful setting your depth stop because you don't want to drill through the top surface of your lid. For the back panel and the lower shelf, you'll need quarter inch thick stock. Now, of course, you can buy quarter inch thick stock and then glue it up if it's too narrow or if you've got some thicker stock you can plane it down. That's where we're at right now. Now what we need to do is trim it up to size. Just a couple of simple operations here at the table saw. For the front edge of the shelf we need an eighth inch radius bull nose on there. Now normally I would have a beading bit to do that with but I don't for this small of material. So what I'm going to use is an eighth inch round over bit and do it in two cuts. Now I'm very carefully now setting the height of the bit so that the wings of the cutter don't mark the face. Then I'll do the same adjustment on the fence. Bring the fence over and then bring it back 
so that my scale just lines up perfectly with that bearing. Now with the front edge bull nosed like that, the only thing left is to notch out this front corner. We'll do that a little bit later when we're machining the drawers. We get started with the drawers by ripping the material over at the table saw. Then over here at the compound miter saw, we can make quick work of cutting off each of the pieces to their proper length. The drawer bottoms get made out of eighth inch thick birch plywood. They're small drawers, so they really don't need to be made out of a heavier material. Now we just need to rip and cross cut those pieces. Along the bottom inside edge, of both the drawer front and the drawer sides, we need to machine this 1 8 inch by quarter inch rabbit. And that will receive the plywood bottom. To machine that, I've set my router bit up, and this just happens to be a 3 quarter inch straight cutting bit. I've raised it up a quarter of an inch and exposed an eighth of an inch of it away from the fence. Now to help guide the part, I'm using the gripper, the GR200 model that has the, the extra support plate. And it has that hook on the back, and it makes this operation go very smoothly. The next operation on our drawer sides is to machine a dado that will receive our bearing slide. That dado needs to be 11 16 wide, quarter inch deep, and centrally located top to bottom. Now to get that centrally located, we have to work in 30 seconds of an inch. It's 13 30 seconds of an inch from the edge of the board to the edge of the dado. So I've got my rip fence set at 13 30 seconds and my stack dado head cutter is set up for 11 16 of an inch cut width. I've also raised it up a quarter of an inch. Now this dado goes on the face opposite our rabbit. Now to help feed the piece I'll be using the same gripper setup I was using over at the router table before. With the dado blade still set up in the table saw, now's a good time to go ahead and cut those rabbits on each end of our drawer fronts. Now I've got the saw blade still at the same height as before, but this time I'm using my miter gauge and a stop block, and that will assure that I get a half inch wide dado that's a quarter inch deep. And that's all there is to that operation. Now is a good time to drill the holes for the drawer pull. Now if you're turning your own pulls, you'll want to use a quarter inch brad point bit and drill nearly through. Just allow the point to come almost out the back side. It should work out to about 3 eighths deep. Moving back to our shelf, we needed to notch out that corner. To do that, I've raised up my stacked dado head cutter to 3 eighths of an inch and adjusted my stop lock over so that I'm taking a quarter inch width of cut. The drawers get assembled with a little bit of glue and some micro pin nails. And because this is a small plywood bottom, we can glue that into our lower rabbet as well. If you're sneaky with your pin nails, you can put them inside that dado where we're going to be mounting up the drawer slide. And that way they'll be concealed. The back gets glued to the bottom and to the two side pieces. And a couple of pin nails along the bottom to help hold that in. it doesn't take a whole lot to turn up these little drawer pulls. And of course if you don't want to turn them, there's plenty of commercially available drawer pulls available to you. A small drop of glue will get it spread around inside the hole. And then we can put in our drawer pull. The drawer slides are these mini bearing drawer slides. They're quite an interesting little device. Now this is the smaller size and they come from Rockler and they get the narrow portion that is gets attached to the sides of our legs. Now we've got to do a little bit of layout but it's very easy. 
you're going to start out by drawing some horizontal lines that will represent the center line for each of the slides, as well as the center line for the drawer. And those lines are 7 eighths of an inch, 2 and a half inches, and 4 and an eighth inches down from the top. Next, we need a line near the front edge of our leg, showing us where the front edge of the drawer is. And it's real easy just to line it up with that rabbit we put on the back of the leg, make a couple little marks, and then draw a line showing that front edge. Now from that line that represents the front edge of the drawer, we're going to make another mark 3 eighths of an inch back at each location. And that'll tell us exactly where we want the drawer slide to be positioned. Now what we want to do then is just draw some cross lines inside some of these hole openings so that we can drill for the mounting screws. Now the narrow portion of the slide gets mounted to our leg. The wide portion of the slide gets mounted in that dado that we machined on the side of the drawer. Now this particular hole right here is threaded. Now this will allow us to mount our slide inside the drawer, that dado that we machined on the drawer. Now what we want to do is take the wide portion of that slide and line it up flush with the back edge. Then we can transfer that hole location into the drawer side and drill through for the machine screw that holds it in place. Using a scratch awl, we can get the starter point set for the drill. Now using a 764 inch drill bit, I'll go ahead and pre-drill for all of those mounting screws. The back edge of the slide will be flush with the back edge of the drawer. Through the threaded hole, mark your location. Take a scratch all, get a starter dimple there, and then we can drill through with the 532 inch drill bit. After some finished sanding, we're ready for some assembly. What we'll be starting with is the bottom shelf and the back and the two legs. Then we can take the shelf and slide that in the dados. Then we can bring the back panel in place and a couple of clamps to hold everything together good and tight. To hold the top onto our legs, we're going to be using six quarter inch diameter dowels. We'll put three at the top of each leg. I've placed a layout mark down the center of the top of the leg, then an inch and a quarter in from each end, I placed another mark, and then one at the center. Now with the holes drilled, I can put a dowel center in each of the holes, and we can transfer the hole location from our leg into the top. Now I've got the top upside down on my workbench, sitting on a cloth to help protect it. Now what I'll do is I'll center up my framework on the top, then I'll make sure the back edge is nice and flush. Then all we need to do is tap the legs and that'll transfer the hole locations into the top. Now I'll place a little drop of glue in each of the dowel holes. Drive in each of the dowel pins and if needed use a block of wood and a hammer and tap it down. With the assembly pretty much done and out of the way at this point, we can turn our attention to some finishing. Now originally I just planned on applying a wipe-on oil and urethane top coat product. However, there's enough sap wood on here where it's very distracting. So what I want to do is color all of the wood. To do the coloring process, I'm going to be applying an aniline dye. This is an alcohol-based product, and you pick it up in a dry powder uh, form. It's a small little container, and generally you just brush it on with a foam brush or something. I don't have any foam brushes, so we'll just use a rag to apply it. Now this particular color is called an antique cherry brown, and I've used it on a couple other projects in the past. I think we uh, used some on some oak and so forth, and it just turned out gorgeous. So we're going to see if it works out real well on this cherry. I'll just wipe on a good wet coat, let it dry, and then we can move on. As you can see, I'm wiping on the top coat at this point. I'm using an oil and urethane product. And you'll also notice that I'm applying the oil and urethane first to my maple pieces, the pieces that don't have stain, 
and then I'll apply it to the actual cabinet that has a stain on it. If I were to start wiping the top coat onto the stain component, I would pick up some of the coloring and transfer that to the maple. Now I'll apply probably three coats of this product sanding lightly between coats with 600 grit sandpaper. After just two coats of the high gloss polyurethane, I'm really not pleased with the look. It's too plastic looking. So what I'll be doing is sanding it down yet once again with 600 grit sandpaper and then I'll be switching to a satin polyurethane and hopefully that'll tone it down a little bit. And just as before, apply it with a cotton rag, wiping with the grain. Once you have the surface wet, even it out by dragging the wet rag across the surface with the grain. Very light touch. Some of that self-adhesive felt makes a nice liner for those pockets on the top of our little chest. Now unfold your barrel hinges so that they're open and get them started in the holes. Now we can take the lid and get the barrel hinges started in there. And the whole point of this is to get the two hinges lined up so that they're opening perpendicular to the back edge of the chest. Get them in as far as you can and hopefully you drilled your holes to the proper depth, which would be half the length of the barrel hinge. Now what we'll do is we'll close the lid and push it down and that should seat the two barrels into both the lid and the top of our chest. Now taking a very small screwdriver, you'll have to tighten up those little screws that expand the barrel and hold them into the holes. To install the drawers, I first installed the slides into the cabinet sides. Then I placed the top drawer in position, slid it in, and then checked for my gap along the top. I want that to be nice and parallel. Once I get that adjusted by moving the slides up and down a little bit, I'll tighten up those screws, holding the slides tight against the side, then I'll install the machine screw that goes from the inside of the drawer into the slide itself. Then I'll repeat that process on the next two drawers. Well, that wraps up the construction. I spent about an hour working on the drawers, getting them lined up nice and even with the gaps running parallel to each other. Also keep in mind that these are not full extension drawer slides, so you won't have full access to the drawer. Now you've seen this one throughout the construction. This is the cherry and maple unit. This one happens to be Jatoba, and we included a, a maple shelf down below to add a little different accent to it. Now if you're looking for this species of wood, it also goes under the trade name of Brazilian Cherry. Now I hope you build one of these. It's a great accessory for either your desk to clean up some of the clutter, or perhaps on top of a dresser as a little jewelry cabinet. And we've got our beret and our bell bottoms. I'm Chris Dayhut for Woodworking at Home. Thanks for watching. I sincerely hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you truly enjoyed it, Please help us share this information with the rest of the communities. Please hit the subscribe button, give us a big thumbs up, and be sure to tell your friends about this channel. Thanks again for watching.